Hi, I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit, The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making, we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources, so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and then found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. It's a beautiful day in paradise, and this is Debbie coming to you from sunny South Florida. It is a gorgeous day this morning. We had a little bit of rain, which makes my flowers so happy, but I'm happy that it's going to be almost 80 degrees today, and this is my kind of winter. Well, my guest today is coming to us from chilly, chilly UK, and she'd say something else, and it actually cracks me up, because my special guest today is Miss Sammy Blundell, and Sammy is a friend of mine that when I was in San Diego a few years ago, I, Sammy and a couple of the girls from the UK blew in, and I was overwhelmed by the energy that came from this group in the, from the UK. And when they said the F word, it made me laugh. And I'm not an <laughs> F word person. But it came out of these girls, and it was so unexpected and so funny. I'm like, I can let them say that, but not on the show today. <laughs> but anyway... I would like to introduce you my special guest, Ms. Sammy Blundell, known as the Brand Builder, and some other things which we'll talk about. Sammy, are you there? I'm here. I'm so happy to be here. I, I'm, it's awesome. Uh, but I I'm feel like so, you're showboating a little bit with your sunny weather. I'm, I'm cringing a little bit at that. <laughs> well, I'm so excited, Sammy. I'm going to throw you, throw you under the bus because I know you're excited to be on the show because you showed up yesterday. I did. I was so excited. I got here a day early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the replay going, who was on here? And I actually listened for 10 <laughs> minutes and nobody spoke. <laughs> so I'm glad you came back. <laughs> oh, well, it's a pleasure so. to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, it's my joy. And Sammy, is. I, I was looking at her bio, and she's got an incredible bio, folks, and I want you to go on and, and just Google her. She's an international, award-winning international speaker, eight times bestseller author, CEO of Brand Builders Club and the One Drop Moment. But she is just a force to be reckoned with in life and in, in business and even on the beach in Punta Cana. Uh, where did we go? Uh, Punta Cana. <laughs> Punta Cana, the Dominican Republic. Um, she and I spent a week down there, which we're going to just talk about, because what a great way to do business, sitting around a pool. Or and it's beach. terrible. Someone's got to do it, though, haven't they? Someone had to do it. And thank goodness we did it before COVID. Um, yes. And honestly, I, I never would have done that, but it was too good to be true. And I was like, I've got to go to the beach with Sammy. <laughs> so, Yay. Sammy, I always start my show... Uh, taking my guests back in time a little bit because I want people mm -hmm. to understand who you are. So can you tell me a little bit about your family, where you grew up, if you had any siblings, some fun stuff. Gosh, how long have you got? I have a really interesting family. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. Well, um, I was born in London um, and I come from a very long line of uh, artists, inventors, creatives, engineers, very, you know, musicians, very musical family. My, my nan, who I used to lovingly call Nanny Boats because she lived right next to the Thames and I could see the boats from her house and she used to be phenomenal on the old Joanna, you know, get the piano out. And um, and she was just phenomenal. And she used to, when you, if you uh, couldn't remember, I don't think anyone on this call will remember this far back, but um, 
before movies had uh, sound, she used to be the woman that was on the piano making the mood and playing all of the the songs and getting everybody going, you know, and creating the mood <laughs> of what was happening on the screen. Um, and so, you know, I, I grew up with a, just an amazing, amazing creative family. And um, my grandma, um, very, um, you know, just amazing with... Um, she could create anything, you know, just uh, such a brilliant artist. My mum, she got that also from my grandma. In fact, my mum has gone on to uh, create this beautiful um, uh, craft centre in France, which uh, unfortunately got a little bit hit throughout lockdown, but she's getting all of her students starting to come back now, uh, coming in from all over France. And people fly in from all over the world to do their um, you know, pottery and glass fusing and craft making and painting and just get really messy and have fun in the studio. And that's what I really that's what I grew up with. I, I grew up around these just incredible creative women and thank goodness I did. You know, there was nothing that would ever stop them. They were unstoppable, but always for good. My grandma um, she well, was an incredible healer and people would travel in from all over to receive healing from my grandma. And actually, when my mum and biological father split up when I was about two, um, we went to live with my grandma and granddad. So when my mum went out to work, it was my grandma that pretty much brought me up in my earliest years so that my mum could work and earn money. And um, And so, you know, I grew up around this amazing healer who had people just arriving at the house all the time and they'd walk in, you know, kind of a little bit broken and they'd walk out with a spring in their step. And I always wondered, how does she do it? And, um, you know, she never, ever took money for it. She just had this little pot on the side that was for charity and people, had, you know, it was like pay what you think it was worth. And she had all this money and she was giving, sending it all to charity. She never, ever kept it for herself. Such a generous gorgeous flame of a woman she was and and I just have so much love in my heart for her and of course then my mum you know she had all of that generosity and all that beautiful spirit but what my mum really had that where my grandma was very much a one-to-one person my mum is like this incredible energy wherever she goes she's like a you know a, a pot of honey like everybody just gravitates towards her and there's nothing that she cannot do and so, uh, you know, wherever she goes, wherever she lives, there's always people that, that she, she just forms a community. She'll, she'll start painting and people around her will say, oh, can I come and learn with you? Next thing you know, she's got a freaking art class and a studio and a pottery barn and all kinds of stuff. So, um, so yeah, you know, there's just amazing women and the men in my life. I've been very fortunate to have very strong men um, that that care about their women, you know, very loyal, um, generous, warm, caring men. And so I've had very fortunate upbringing, really. I, I remember when I went to do my public speaker training and I could hear all these people with this kind of rags to riches story. And I remember feeling so insignificant thinking, I don't have a story like that. <laughs> been so lucky uh, with my with my upbringing but um so yeah I, I i was born in london then grew up in essex where my grandma and granddad lived and uh, my granddad was an electrical engineer so he used to go out on the oil rigs all the time and he used to bring back all these fabulous presents for me um which really set off my imagination gosh you know there's things that i'm remembering now as i'm saying them i remember him bringing me back this russian doll and um, and it had this, you know, the, the dolls where it has a doll within a doll within a doll. And I was just fascinated with this. And, of course, that's kind of the work that I do now is, you know, these people that have built these big walls around them and, you know, they're, they're building businesses and they're going out into the world and doing stuff. And I know that's not who they really are, you know, and we've got to take some of those things off and peel back some of those layers to work out who really are you if you're going to go out and make that legacy in the world who are you so I love this question it's such a good question and um, as a result of growing up in Essex when I was 19 I left and went off to university and um, and so traveled around I ended up um, getting married and moving up to Leeds which is in the north of England and that's consequently where I went on to build five of my businesses 
And um, and I did that right up until the point that I burned out big time and almost had a heart attack. And um, by which point my mum and dad had moved over to France in Brittany, in northern France. And they'd been out there since the millennium. And so I chose, I made a big decision. It took me a long time to make that decision. I felt like I was doing the splits in my life. Maybe some of you listening in now might have that feeling as well where you've got one foot in one life and it's the life you've created and it's you know it's a great life but it's not it's not your life you know you're living that life for someone else it's not what you were born to do and maybe that was the path you were meant to be on but it's not the path anymore and I was getting such pains in my chest my heart was really letting me know that look you've gone as far as you can go here you've 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 done what you can do. It's time to leave. And I had this very strong calling to hand it all over. And that's what I did. I walked away from my multi-million pound business and moved to France with my dog and a car packed full of stuff. And my mum and dad said, come and live in one of the holiday cottages and and be safe there while you make your next move. And thank God for, for them, really. Um, it was that gave me the time to rehabilitate and to to nurture myself and actually give back to myself and it it, it made me realize just how much my family had given to me and yet I had hardly seen them while I was so busy building 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 growing building growing that I realized I'd actually left behind all of the people that I really cared about and Debbie you and I were talking just before we came on here about you know, all the stories that our parents have that we never get the time to ask. And it was only through the process, actually, of almost having a heart attack, walking away from everything and following purpose instead of profit that that I really got to know my mum for the first time in a long time. And I realized that, you know, it's crazy. I realized that I'd, I'd put my grandma into memories that actually were my mum. Things like my first day of school, I remember my grandma taking me to my first day of school, but my mum said it was her that took me, you know, when I learned to swim. I remember my grandma teaching me to swim. My mum said, grandma couldn't even swim. It was me that taught you to swim. I thought, wow, isn't it interesting how how our mind can play those kind of games and tricks on us. And so, yeah, that was that was a beautiful, very enriching time getting to know my mum all over again and um, and also being reminded that we are both such strong personalities that we cannot live in the same place for very long <laughs> we had that realization too so it was just while I, I was living I, in a holiday cottage next door <laughs> oh gosh I understand that I, I my mom lives about 10 minutes from me and I love her to death but we, we do need some space sometimes um, I want to go yeah. back a little bit Tammy because I know you're such a strong outgoing energetic woman but my show is called The Woman Behind the Smile, right? Stand up and speak yeah. up. At what point, when you were little, I, I know there's a story mm. that goes back that there was a time, <clears throat> excuse me, when you were hurt by kids, you know, yeah. like a bully situation. And yeah. that's when I think, that looking back at your life, that that's where the mask went up. That's when yeah. I think you say you shut up and shut it out. I like I to did, say, yeah. you know, the woman behind the smile. What was your woman behind the smile moment as a, mm. as a young girl? Mm, gosh. Well, it was. I guess because um, because my mum and biological father split up when I was so young, and we went to live with my grandma. Um, I never actually really played with kids my own age. So from right from being you know a toddler up until the point that I went to school. Um, like I didn't live near anyone that was the same age as me. And so I used to see all of these big kids, these grown-up kids, as I, I thought they were, going off to school. Well, the reality was they were probably only a year or two older than me. But I just, I, I was like, I want to be like them. And I remember every day I'd be my chin on the wall looking at all these kids going to school. I'm like, I want to be that. So I always wanted to be older before I could be. <laughs> and, and I remember my first day of school, just uh, you know I was bouncing around like a little flea I was so excited because I was a big girl now I was going off to big girls school and uh, I remember going and and just being you know this wide-eyed wonder 
of just seeing, you know, this delicious creativity, you know, all these kids playing in the playground. I was an only child and my mum had gone to work. It was just me and my grandma who was, you know, easily in her 50s or something by that point. So I didn't have anyone around me my own age. So to see all these kids that were the same age as me was just amazing. And I remember the bell going at break and us all kind of running out into the playground. And I remember like it was a feast for my eyes looking at all these kids my age, you know, they were all playing. And I went running over to this group of girls that were playing the skipping rope game, you know, when they go one, two, three, one, two, three, and they kind of count you in and you jump in and you jump over. And, um, and I was just, you know, captivated by this game and I've never seen it before. And bearing in mind, I'm about I'm about five years old at this point, and I go running over to this group of girls, and I remember this girl just putting her hand like just straight in my face, and she was only the same age as me, so you know, another another five year old girl with her little pigtails, and she puts her hand in my face, and she's like, "Go away, fat, so you're too fat to play this game," you know. Of course, they all then started sniggering and laughing, and that moment was a big defining moment for me because I totally shut down because that was like, okay, if if this is what it means to be around other people my own age, I don't want this. And it also made me look at myself and what I hadn't realized because I'd had no comparison of other kids to play with at that point. I didn't realize that I was a severely obese child. And my grandma had been, you know, God bless her, she was, she was a feeder. And she'd, she'd just have sweets and crisps and all kinds of stuff all around all the time. And, of course, my mum wasn't there. And so if I got upset that my mum wasn't there, she'd say, oh, it's okay, go and get yourself something nice, you know. So, so I very quickly learned to replace love with food and associate food with love. And and I hadn't realized how different I was from the other kids. You know, I was you know, quite a bit bigger than the other kids. And, um, and that pretty much was a course that was set for me then for the rest of my life. And um, up until about four years ago, three years ago, it was when we were in San Diego, I had this massive realization about that very moment, you know. And somebody asked me, I think it was Catherine, asked me, um, Sammy, what, you know, what, what did they call you at school? And I think she thought I was going to say, you know, Sambo or something, you mm-hmm. know, Sammy or whatever. And, I, and the first words that leapt out of my mouth were fat. And I remember, like, the look on her face. She wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting that to fly out of my mouth. But ultimately, that was the starting point of the realization of how much that situation had actually affected me and broken me at that time and it it was it was one of those defining moments where I realized my god you know is that why I've done everything in my life the way I have is that why I've bought bullies for other people is that why I've been you know so focused on making sure that people are not branding themselves in a way that they they feel like they should be perceived you know because I ended up growing up on diet after diet after diet and even at my slimmest I still felt I was too fat you know I was too fat to be accepted I was too fat to be liked I was too fat to get on stage I was too fat to to mean anything to anyone you know and I grew up with that as my kind of unconscious sat nav directing me all throughout life and you know ultimately I realized that that day in the playground I let that girl brand me and I then took that brand on and I lived that brand and there was nothing that I could do that would undo that. It was like a curse. It was like a curse that I I took and I said, okay, that's the curse I'm going to live with, you know. Um, But of course, no one would have known this because there I am, you know, on documentaries, on stages, speaking all over the world. Uh, pretending, you know, I'm the woman behind the smile, pretending, you know, I'm confident and I've got this, I've totally got this. And inside, I'm just like, you know, God, I'm going to start opening my mouth and I pray that you are going to speak for me because I don't know what, (laughs) I don't know if I've got it in me. Uh, But every time, every time I've opened my mouth to speak, the right thing has always come through me. And so 
I think that the you know the way that we have those defining moments as kids they they certainly set us on the path I guess it's you know listening into a show like this or meeting someone like yourself that then makes you question okay well like is that the path that I'm meant to be on did I let that person create something within me that actually isn't me but it was a mask and um and so yeah it's it's fabulous what you're doing honestly i absolutely love what you're doing well i thank you for for that story because it, honestly when i first saw you in san diego i'm thinking oh my gosh this woman is just unbelievable she's magnetic she's got so so vibrant she's got such energy she's so positive and confident and then i'm thinking well, what am I doing here? You know? <laughs> Don't. I looked at you. I thought the same thing. No, it, well, it's <laughs> funny how we look at each other and think those yeah. things, and it's it's really our mirror of what we went yeah. through too. And and yeah. uh, I had a very heavy time when I was young, and I remember you know, going shopping with my mom, and I'd have to go to the the big women's department and get the, uh, the pants with the elastic around the waist, and yeah. and all you know, I was an athlete. And everybody would say, oh, you're just such a, you've got big bones. You're just an athletic girl. <laughs> and I'm looking back now at the same, got same bones. But yeah, in yeah. my mind, I still have that big girl. When I yeah. look in the mirror, it's that big girl. And I'm like, so how do we get past that? And I love how mm-hmm. you say, um, and this applies to, you know, people that have been hurt or taken advantage of it anyway. You once said in your books, um, if you don't take control of your label, which could be yeah. victim, failure, gullible, fat, so gold yeah. digger, whatever, you are leaving your reputation on the table and someone else yeah. will brand you. Yes. Explain They'll that. They'll define you. Well, it's, it's like the girl, isn't it, that, that said, go away, fat, so you're too fat to play here. She branded me in that moment. Um, you know, uh, one of our uh, good uh, friends, and she's one of my members, um, you know, she said uh, she's grown up with ADHD. She was undiagnosed um, till she was 70. She was 70 when she was diagnosed with ADHD, and yet she'd lived 70 years under the label of lazy, crazy, and stupid. Mm. And you think, you know, when you're in a, um, you know, maybe a narcissistic relationship, I mean, I would imagine that everybody at some point on the planet has been <laughs> in a situation whether you know through uh, relationship or through work as, as met, you know a narcissist or you know somebody that um, you know is in so much pain themselves that that's their their modality is to inflict pain on others and they don't know any other way of being but that doesn't mean that we don't take that in and so on goes another layer on goes another mask you know now I'm going to wear the mask of being lazy oh today i'm you know oh now i'm you know wearing the mask of being stupid now i'm wearing the mask of being fat now i'm wearing the mask of being unworthy and you know as you said it, it's these um and we borrow them do you know what do you know what i mean we don't they're not even ours but we borrow them and at some point someone kind of lands it on us you know like a meringue pie in the face and goes there you go <laughs> you have it now um well, you know, it's it's almost like if you picked up a chair and that chair was a limiting belief, you could pick, or even a glass of water. I mean, you've seen people do that before. You know, if you pick up that glass of water, a full glass, um, you know, just if you imagine that that glass is some kind of limiting belief or something painful that someone said to you, and you've decided actually, you know, uh, well, I'm going to carry that. Well, that glass of water for a minute or a, a moment or a, even an hour might get a bit annoying but you carry that around for the next 40 years that's it's going to make a significant impact on you and that's what we do isn't it we we don't give the chair back we don't give the water back <laughs> we we just carry it with us and it's not until we kind of grow up and get older that we realize we have been wearing somebody else's mask it wasn't even ours in the first place and we have to be really careful because it happens all the time. And, and you're yeah. a public person, a personality and you're out there and I'm out there. I was on a, an interview the other day and I happened, and I never do this, but I happened to look at the little comments underneath mm. and people are so quick to, yeah. to again, label, you know. 
it's yeah. gullible or stupid or why did they do that? And mm-hmm, that shuts mm-hmm. the person down. If you look yeah. at it, and I was told from very very uh, early on when I started speaking out about the scam, don't read what people say. Don't mm-hmm. ever read the bottom feeders because yeah, yeah. If people are trying, maybe they're doing it to try to make themselves feel a little bit better, but it doesn't mm-hmm. help you and it, it can shut you down. So if you had... You could have stopped. You could have said, I'm never going out there again. I'm never going to play on the playground again. I'm never going to speak yeah. again. How did you keep going and not let those thoughts, I mean, you pretended for a while, honestly, <laughs> Gosh, right? I think, you know, to a certain extent, I still do. I, you know, it's um, there's always going to be within me, and I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't know whether I'd want to lose it either, you know, it's just at the yeah. same time, it's who I am and, you know, I get to choose, you know, it's almost like um, tuning up the radio, you know, I want to turn the volume up so I can turn the volume up or I can turn it down and, um, you know, I quite like parts of myself that, you know, the human that I've become, you know, I, I have empathy for others because of what's happened to me. Right. I care about others because of what's happened to me. You know, I get very nervous before I go on stage or, you know, I'm speaking, um, you know, I get very nervous almost to the point of being sick. But then I think that makes me very humble and it makes me human when I get up on the stage, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's this massive, like, fear of rejection that that I I have lived with forever, be, you know, um, because not only from that moment, but with my parents splitting up as young as I was, you know, I, I it was like my biological dad. One minute he was there, the next minute he wasn't, you know, um, and you, you don't find out until you're an adult what the actual situation was, situation was behind it. But my mum tells me I don't actually remember this, but when my mum. Mum and dad were, um, they were getting uh, married. She was remarrying. And um, Martin is just one of my my best friends in the world. He's just the most gorgeous dad. I'm so lucky. Um, And so I was about three and a half, four maybe, when when they got married. And uh, because we were living with my grandma. My mum and I were living with my grandma at the time. And they were buying their own house. And um, and by all accounts, which, as I said, I don't remember this, but by all accounts, my mum tells me that um, one day I just stopped talking. Now, anybody that knows me would probably have a very hard time believing that I would stop talking. Even <laughs> I don't believe that it was possible. But apparently for a very long time, and we're talking, I think it was a matter of weeks. I'll, it, this is one of the things I'll have to ask my mum. But I think it was a good like few weeks I refused to talk to my mum. And and I wouldn't talk to my dad. And and I'd gone from like we'd been best friends to all of a sudden not communicating with them at all. They couldn't get me to open up. I shut down. Um, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I wouldn't tell my grandma. Like I just wouldn't. I wouldn't talk to anybody. And it was only when um, my mum. I think it was a couple of weeks later. My mum came into my bedroom at my grandma's house and said, um, "Come on then, darling. Come and see your new room." And, I, and she said, you looked up at me like puzzled as if to say, what do you mean? And she said, we're going to the new house. And she said it suddenly clicked. She thought, I thought that she was leaving as well. And so I'd shut down so that it wouldn't hurt as much as it did when I lost my dad. Mm-hmm. And as a child, of course, I would not have understood the rationalization behind that. Even my mum as an adult didn't understand what was going on. It was only in that moment that she realized that. And, um, you know, that, that was another, even though it worked out and I had my own bedroom and I was moving with them and we were going to be a happy family and, you know, everything was going to be good. I didn't know that at the time. And so my cells in my body, like my atoms as such, uh, must have taken that in. They took that in. And, and, you know, as a result of other things that happened with growing up and, um, you know, didn't really, uh, well, I didn't have any relationship with my biological father. And when I was 19, um, we had, um, we met again for the first time. And that's when, this is where it gets really fun. That's when I found out that I have a brother and sister that I didn't even know existed. Um, and so I'm 19 I find out that I've got a 15 year old brother and a 7 year old sister and um, and like everything just goes crazy at that time because 
I'd grown up an only child and all I'd ever dreamt of was having a brother or sister to play with. And so I'm like, at this age, I'm 19, I find out that I could have had a brother to play with like pretty much my entire life. And, um, and I got really angry about that. I remember feeling really resentful at, um, at my mum for not telling me and for keeping it a secret from me. Um, and, you know, I, I understood when, when we actually sat down and, and had a conversation about it. She said, look, you know, I knew what your dad was like and I knew how he was treating his other kids. And, um, you know, he, he'd say that he was going to be there and then he wouldn't show up and he'd let them down and the kids would get really excited. And, you know, his, his other partners that he had after my mum, you know, they just had a really hard time and they're bringing their kids up. And, of course, my brother and sister were really damaged by that. And my mum wanted to keep me away from that completely. And so um, my dad adopted me. um, And we celebrate that every year. Like a, it's almost like an anniversary. (laughs) We celebrate in December every year. You know, 10 a.m., that's when you adopted me. They signed the papers over. And, and, um, you know, again, another story. My mum, I I didn't realize this, but back then, I don't know if it still happens this way now, but for my dad to adopt me, apparently my mum had to give me up so that they could both adopt me completely. So I'm fully adopted, but my mum is my mum, <laughs> which mm. is very odd. But she said it was the worst 24 hours of her life. Um, you know, just like that that whole thing of, you know, having to, to let me go to be able to, to, to keep me. So, you know, I mean, that must have been incredibly hard for her. I can't even imagine what that must be like, you know, to to love somebody so much, to want to give them everything that you have and um, but have to give it all up to be able to keep it. I mean, how crazy. Yeah, well, it's I I love the way you talk about your mom and the relationship with your mom and your grandma, and uh, and it takes me back to my show last week, which was an an hour with mom, and I, mm. I you and I talked about a little bit about that. It's so important for us right yeah. now to if our parents are our lives to sit down and and really talk to them and ask them those questions. Like I, I laughed at the very end of my show. I said, Mom, who's your favorite child? <laughs> and she said, I'll never tell. Your daddy will, but I'll never tell. But it's really important because so much of what they went through is what is reflected in us. And we do things yeah. unconsciously, and you know, washing the dishes. Why, why are the girls washing dishes? Well, because that's what they did at great grandma's house. I'm like, mm. well, let's change that one. Um, <laughs> but it's just interesting uh, to see how we do it and how I hear a lot of, in, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot in you about, um, protecting and safe places, and, mm. and, and I, I feel those things too. We're going to transition a little bit to when you and I met in San Diego, mm. and how did San Diego and Awakening Giants change your life? Mm. Gosh, well, the other um, than the time with Donna, the. Uh, I would say that I I went to that. It was, I did the same thing that that you just talked about a little while ago. I, I I made a big mistake. I you know we'd been kind of brought together and um, you know kind of headhunted. I guess each of us you know we'd gone through a huge interview process. We'd um, by the time we got out there, um, you know, a lot of work had been done by the team on the documentary. And um, and so, you know, and I tend to not look at stuff until last minute um, or, you know, like with shows like this, people will say, uh, do you want me to send you the questions? And I'm like, no, I just want it to be whatever is meant to come out is meant to come out. Um, and I've, I've just always been that way because I trust I trust myself and I trust my higher self to always be present. I trust myself to always do the right thing and um, and for the words to flow when I open my mouth. I just trust that it's going to be there. And so there I am the day before and I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe that's not a strategy I should use for this. But I should, oh gosh, you know, I should prepare. I should find out more about what it is that I'm flying out to tomorrow. Oh God, you know, how is it that I've, I've not done it for this? And I started panicking a little bit and so 
I went into the Facebook group that had been created for us at that time and um, and I clicked on everybody and I went and found all of your web addresses and I went and looked you all up and by the time I'd done that I just thought why have they even invited me to go on this thing look at all of these amazing thought leaders that are doing the most phenomenal things around the world who am I to be on there that that little girl in the playground with the fake the hand in her face that's exactly how I felt then and that really triggered me and I thought I don't even know if I want to get on that plane tomorrow like why why am I even going why <laughs> I started really questioning myself and so I went out a very insecure person I would say a very insecure person and I left with just so much love in my heart for these women that had become family these strangers that had become friends and then family just you know i had i suppose one of the things that has happened in my upbringing was I, I went into um the world of corporate as many many people do and it was very masculine and i was surrounded by men and so inevitably when i set up my first business um, I, I ended up working with a lot of men. Uh, my first branding client was a man. You know, he then went and referred me to all of his friends who were all men. <laughs> it was like I, um, when I built my, my third business, I remember uh, I ran an event and I, I stood there in the room and I looked at all of the people that were in the room and I'd invited them all. And I hadn't even realized that um, until that moment, I looked around and I thought, I'm the only woman in this room. Hmm. Is that odd? And so there I am then on Awakening Giants, and it's only women. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to be hell. This is going to be hell. <laughs> I, just, I didn't associate with women. I, did, I didn't have what I considered to be feminine energy, you know. And I went out there. Um, I, came back a, I came back a changed person, you know, the the feelings of sisterhood that I hadn't experienced before because, you know, I was, I was like 19 when I found out about my brother and sister. I was 11 when my mum and dad had kids. They'd been trying for a long, long time. Um, and finally, when I was 11, they had my first brother, Lee. And then when I was 12, they had my brother, Kieran. But by that point, there was already too big an age gap. It was like I was going off to uni when they were starting school. And so, I was more like a second mum in some ways. Um, I was always the one that got sent in if they were getting bullied, funny enough. It was always me that got sent round to, to deal with it. Um, but, you know, it's just as, a, as, I, as I came back from um, San Diego, having had that experience being surrounded by women and feeling for the first time that I had sisters, like proper sisters, it, it was a realisation that actually I'm not alone and I, I felt very safe in that environment that had been created for us. And, um, and it gave me a lot of trust. It gave me a lot of trust in other people that I hadn't felt before. And, Which is, you know, it's just, interesting that you're saying. I'm, looking, I'm thinking of, uh, in particular, when we went up, and this can put you on an edge, when we went up to the challenge course. Uh, remember walking <laughs> up the hill? I do. <laughs> <laughs> What were, your, what were your that. thoughts when you saw that? For me, it was fun because it brought back my Air Force days, and I'm like, I can do this, you know? And yeah, I was yeah. probably one of the more older ones. Um, it, I had my moments, but um, initially I was like, well, this is going to be cool. I haven't done this. Um, how did you feel, and particularly when you started climbing the pole? Well, I mean, it was it was really interesting, actually, because... We have, I don't know if you have it over there, but there's a brand over here in the UK called Go Ape, and it's like a tall trees course, so you put your zip wires on. I've always been the kind of person that I'll throw myself at a death slide. I love that kind of thrill, right? So when I saw that, um, uh, you know, this 40-foot telegraph pole-looking thing, I thought, oh, easy, no problem, you know, because I've done it so many times before, and I love stuff like that until I realized that um, there was a human that would be <laughs> attached to me. So she was going to be on the ground rather than me being attached to it. You know, when in the UK, you attach yourself to the, the wire and, you know, you walk around and you're, you're 40 foot up in the trees, but you're completely protected. With this, 
there was nothing to protect you other than the, the human being at the bottom. And of course, I still have this weight issue in my head at that time. So I'm looking at this girl thinking, if I fall off this, there's no way you're going to be able to catch me. And so all of my fat stuff starts coming back. And what's going through my mind is, oh my God, what if I get up there and I look like an idiot? What if I can't do it? And so all this negative self-talk, you know, all the things that we would never say to somebody else. But there I am saying it to myself, jab, jab, jab. There you go. Oh, have another one in the ribs, you know. And um, and so I went from thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to enjoy this to this being like the worst day of my life. And I remember watching all of you go up, you know, scaling this, this pole so easily and elegantly. And uh, I just thought, oh, no. Um, you know, I got about halfway up it and thought, oh, I don't want to do this. And, of course, my mind's making lots of um you know, decisions for me. It's, I, I'd forgotten to take my rings off. So as I'm climbing up and my, my um, fingers are, are um, grasping for the next uh, piece of the ladder to get me up this pole, um, of course, we'd put mosquito oil on. So my hands are slipping. And every time I, I grasp another um, rung of this ladder thing, um, my rings are pinching my fingers. And so I'm talking to myself about all of those things. I'm not thinking, you know, just keep going, just keep going, just keep going, you know, get to the top, which is what I would do if I were, you know, on a summit or if I was on stage or, you know, with any of those things. It's like, well, you know, I just see the end. I've already seen the end in mind. I know the result I want. I've imagined it exactly as I want it to be. In that moment, I didn't have that happening for me it was just sheer ego was stopping me from getting up that pole and um, my, my mind's making every excuse up to, to stop me from doing it and inevitably um, I talked to myself out of doing it and I didn't even get halfway up it I don't think and I said I need to get down and uh, and the lady said come on you can do it and everybody starts cheering me on well of course everybody's looking at me by this point so now I'm feeling super self-conscious totally out of my depth and um you know feeling like a complete fool and of course i'm like uh, in my head i'm going yeah you've been branded an idiot you might as well just get down now and um and so i I did i got down and i remember sitting on the little picnic bench watching other people go and do it again you know for the second time and i remember peggy peggy who stopped growing at three foot ten you know the 62 year old vibrant woman she's three foot ten um, you know, she's shorter than my seven-year-old niece and she hadn't been able to do it the first time. And then she goes, that's it, I'm doing this, you know. And she blooming does it. And yet the, the, the like rungs of the ladder were about the same height as her in total. So, you know, she's not only reaching for the next one and putting her foot on the next one and then pushing herself up. She's literally dragging herself up that thing. She got to the top of it. She shouted out, I remember her shouting, I can do it, <laughs> and pretty much threw herself off the thing to come back down again. And I thought, oh, God, now she's done it. I've got to do it. And just as I went to get up, um, they called time and said, right, come on, guys, everyone get back to the hut. And I just remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm literally the only one that didn't do it. And just that that embarrassment, the shame all of those feelings they all just came up and I felt like that little girl in the playground again and uh, yeah just I can actually feel it now I can feel the emotion that mm-hmm. I felt stood there just I felt like I'd let everyone down but most of all I'd let myself down I'd lied to myself that I couldn't do it and and it was through that process that I actually realized well if I'm lying to myself that I can't do that what else am I lying to myself about that I can't do? So I came back from that trip ready to do anything. <laughs> there was nothing going to stop me then. You know, it was like, right, is that a lie? Is this really me? Is, am I making this decision? Is this coming from a higher source? And it made me start to really question stuff. And I tell you, I've done a lot more in my life in the last three or four years since we, we went and filmed that in San Diego than I'd done in the previous 40 years of my life. Well, it's amazing, Sammy, because you know no one else there would have looked at you as a failure. You know, it was, and I and I remember you said you said you set your expectations. Say, I'll be happy if I get halfway up. Yeah. Well, you already set a limit. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and you got halfway up, so you be. You know. 
Mm, um, I but know. then you also said that protecting yourself held your, held you back from achieving so much. It yeah. allows, and that's true with all of us. But we live small if we don't open ourselves yeah. up. So explain how how have you been able to now move forward from that and explode again? Because you you took some time <laughs> off. You, you got did. burned out, right? Yeah. I mean, successful yeah. people can burn out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, and not learn the lesson and burn out again. <laughs> um, uh, I think, um, you know, what was, what's really interesting and I, I, I was teaching this, we, I run a mastermind and um, we, a couple of weeks ago, one of my members, um, she came onto the session and, and I said, right, you know, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, anything that you need, I'm here, like, you know, ask away. And, um, and she said something about, um, Imposter syndrome. Mm. And I said, oh, yeah, I know imposter syndrome. Yes, that, that hung around for a long time, I said. And, and I shared the story about the poll um, in a lot more depth than I, I did here just with you. But um, I shared, you know, the, the emotional roller coaster of the, the whole thing, you know, and what, what happened fully. And, um, and, you know, I said, the way I get over that now is in my mind. I build a bigger freaking pole. Like if I'd have, if there'd have been an 80 foot pole next to the 40 foot one, I'd have totally overachieved the 40 foot one. <laughs> but because I'm looking at it and it's like a mountain to me, I've got nothing to contrast or compare it to. And I think that's what we sometimes do when we do something new or we go into something with expectations of, oh yeah, that's going to be easy. And then it's not as easy as we thought it was, or I say this to my husband, Greg, all the time, oh, you've just, this is a job before a job, like, he'll ask me to do something, and I'll go to do it, but then something else has to be done before that thing can be done, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just like that, isn't it, like, you, you end up with a job before a job, you, you think, oh, I'm going to send an email out to all of my list, and then you realize, oh, I've got to write it first, that's a job before a job, you know, so you, <laughs> the, we have all these jobs before a job before a job before you can actually do the thing. And, um, you know, and so I think that is the same, you know, when you, when you have these expectations as I did of, oh, this is going to be easy. I love doing this, you know, and then getting to it and it wasn't easy like I thought it was. And then you aim, you add blame, shame and guilt to it and you start um, adding fat so to it and then you start adding all the masks to it before you've even taken one step, you know, you've just set yourself up for for failing where you know you've you've now created that um that infinite loop of you've told yourself you can't do it and guess what you're right <laughs> and so it taught me that if i'm ever faced with anything like that i go to the opposite end and i play with what ifs now and um and that's a strategy that i i shared with uh, with them on the call the other week you know i go to what ifs like if I'm looking at something, I think, oh, God, I'm never going to be able to do that. I'll say, well, what if I did? What if it actually worked out to be the best thing I've ever done? What if I do that and I achieve twice what I thought I would? What if? And I just, I, I, I call them moonshots. So I create moonshots. If I could shoot for the moon in this area, what would I do? And the how, I don't even think about the how. I just think on the what. What do I want? And that's actually what gets me through a lot of things. <laughs> it gets, gets me through a lot, um, you know, especially coming through lockdown. You know, I mean, I was, I was running 34 of my own events every month all around the world, and I'd built up a big team of ambassadors that were all building their businesses at the same time as working with me to, to build mine in different countries, feet on the ground. And, um, in fact, many of the, the people that, I met at, um, at the documentary where you and I met, um, you know, they went on to become great partners and they helped me to launch in the States and, um, you know, we launched in Brisbane and Bali and uh, all over Holland and other parts of Europe, uh, all across America and, and then lockdown hits and, um, and so, you know, by that point I was very familiar with speaking on stage, I was all over the place and then all of a sudden it, it just stopped, well, then two years later, and I've got this speaking gig that, that I've been booked for two years before, and I have to get up on stage and go go speak. And it was a um, 
it was a dear friend of mine, Matt Wilson, was running his event in the UK, in Brighton, in the UK. And I remember I was on day three. So I'd already got to see all of these fantastic speakers that were, of course, all way better than me. And, oh, they've got it going. And, God, you know, they're so brilliant. And, oh, you know, who am I to get up on this stage? I'm not practiced. And, you know, so it keeps coming back. You know, it's, I don't know that it's ever anything that I'll, I'll really get over. Um, it has got easier. And, of course, the more you get up and speak, the easier it becomes. But having not done it for two years, and then getting up on stage. Um, you know, I just, I remember walking out onto the beach in Brighton the day before I was speaking, and I just got really quiet with myself, with the sea just lapping in front of me. And I just thought to myself, okay, I'm just letting go of all this because it's not helping me. What is it the audience needs? Because this isn't about me. This is no longer about me. This is about them. This is about them. This is about them. And I started to really imagine that they were this this beautiful audience of of spirits who needed help who wanted support and i just tuned into those spirits and that energy of what do you need from me and i ended up getting on stage and doing a very different presentation than the one they'd actually booked me for but it was the one that got a standing ovation and i had no idea because the lights were so bright on the stage <laughs> that I didn't even see what was happening. And the MC came running up on stage. He said, can you see what's going on down there? And there were all these people up out of their seats and, you know, crying, clapping, laughing. And, um, and I think that's what happens where, you know, and it, it's when you let go, you grow. And, you know, and I let go of all of the, the shame and the compare and despair and the imposter syndrome when I was sat in that deck chair on Brighton Beach. I just let go of all of that and and just went up onto that stage as me, as Sammy. And to, to, to be able to do that and be worthy, be relevant, be kind, be generous, be the very example of what love is in no matter what industry you are in, to get up and do that with grace, generosity, and gratitude, which is very much my grandma. They're, I would say the three core values of my grandma and I and my mum, and I bring them into everything that I do. And I measure myself by those things. So I don't measure myself anymore on money because I've, I've had everything that money can buy and I ended up giving it all away. And my husband and I, just before lockdown, ended up like selling the house, giving everything away and we moved on to a boat and we travel full time now and we've done that for the last, you know, just over two years because we didn't need all that stuff. We had the house, the car, the cash, we had all those things and no freaking time to enjoy any of them. So what was the point in having them? Um, you know, so we, we set different priorities for ourselves and, and you know, we, we started to focus on what's important. And, um, you know, you, you can never buy back time. But when you, when you do run a business successfully, it will buy you the time to spend with those people. And I realized that because I didn't have a strong vision for my life, I had a strong vision for my businesses before I burned out, but I didn't have a vision for my life. So I was living for the business. I was living to make money. I was living to keep up with everybody else. And I don't need that anymore. Um, you know, so I think that, that when, you, when you remove some of those masks and you realize, you know, like when you think, well, when I've got 100 grand in the bank, then I'll be happy. Uh, when I've got that car on the drive, then I'll be happy. When I've got X, Y, Z, then I'll be happy. I can promise you that none of that stuff will ever make you happy. So, you know, really identify what is it that does make you happy and set that as a vision so you build everything so that you have that and don't build it just because you can build it because you must it's a must you know it's a this is my legacy this is my purpose this is my passion this is this is a must for me i get up every day and i'm living breathing eating sleeping walking talking this living legacy i don't want to die to leave a legacy i want to live a freaking legacy today in this minute minute in this moment you know Leave the legacy wherever you are. And most importantly, live the legacy. Be the legacy. Be the very best example of how you want other people to remember you. And I'd like people to remember me as 
kind and generous and loving and so uh, that that's more the focus for me now if ever I, if ever I feel like I'm going into compare and despair I, I'm like actually do you know what <laughs> that's not who I am I am love I am grace I am generosity and I am one drop <laughs> well and you are and I'm thinking I'm I'm feeling the ripple <laughs> you know I, I think of it tossing <laughs> that little stone in the pond and seeing it ripple and that yeah. is so true Sammy and and it's not about the money I mean I lost a husband who walked out the door one morning and he died the next day and I never saw him so God, all those yeah. plans of you know make the money and have the investments and mm. do all this stuff mm. it didn't matter it didn't yeah. matter because he was gone and that's how I live every single day now is that yeah. make sure that you tell tell them you love them before they walk mm -hmm. out the door because mm. we don't know when the last minute is that mm. we're going to see the, the people we love most we don't know when we're talking to a client that maybe we're you know the one happy person they're talking to that day and exactly you know or the I'd, rather, I'd rather give a bottle away to someone that couldn't really afford it than than not because oh well it's going to cost me eight dollars because I gave it away yeah. it's not about that anymore it's about what can we do to make a difference in one person's life today yeah one drop. And you're Just doing that. that so effect for someone. It's amazing, and, and our hour has flown by, Sammy. I knew it would, but what? <laughs> we haven't even talked about what you're really doing now on the One Drop. So how can people see what you're doing and get a hold of you if they want to get involved? Because the whole One Drop movement is, is social change on a global level, and it's lovely. Yeah. It comes from your heart. How can people get a hold of you? Mm, well, I would say the very best way... Um, is to come join the Facebook group. I, I have a Facebook group that I started last year called One Drop Movement Global. Um, and, you know, every single day we, we show up. Like, what is the one drop? What's the one thing you're going to do today that will take you closer to the ripple of impact you were born to make? And, you know, it's so funny. You know, like Nancy talks about the one, and I'm so connected to that. And then you've got, yeah, I can't remember who wrote the book, The One Thing. And it's ultimately, you know, it's about getting up and doing that one thing that's going to make a difference to you and to somebody else. Be the ripple you want to see in the world, the ripple of change. And so, you know, come and join the Facebook group. Let's start the conversation there. Um, I, in that group, I've run different challenges within that. I ran one uh, at Christmas. The, it was... Um, a calendar of Christmas kindness and everybody got involved and I gave them one tiny little thing they could do for five minutes and I went live each day here's, here's your next five minute thing just something you could go and do that would create a ripple of kindness in the life of somebody else and miracles were happening all throughout that in the lead up to Christmas and you know anyone could go through that at any time it doesn't have to be Christmas to to go through the kindness challenge but you know when, if you implement 25 days of kindness and you follow the the things that I gave you to do um, like that you will see miracles in your life and you'll see miracles in the lives of others and if out of that your business grows that's a beautiful byproduct if out of that you grow it's a beautiful byproduct I, I just think you know the more you give the more you receive and the more you receive the more you can give so yeah come come and join us we're at onedropmovement.com is the website and come and join us in the one drop movement web in uh, facebook group it's amazing i'm going to jump right on and, and look at those uh it, it, I'm looking at the picture of you with that orange donut around you know the life <laughs> around your neck and I'm just laughing because it orange is you. It <laughs> you know? is, isn't it? <laughs> orange is the new black, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I love your bright colors and that's your energy and, and your personality. And I know that there's that woman behind the smile there, Sammy, and that we all have it. Uh, but you haven't let it stop you from making a difference in the world, and, and I really treasure that. So thank you so much for being my guest today. <laughs> You've got so much to give, and together we'll, we'll all make a difference in the world. So again, thank you, my friend. I really appreciate you. Oh, I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you so much. And to those of you that are listening, you know, be that drop you want to see in the world. And, and just you know, one drop is enough. You don't have to be the whole freaking ocean. One drop. <laughs> just one drop at a time. Just one drop. And just know that you make a difference. And that one drop, it matters. So keep doing it.
One last quick question. This is for me for going forward. If you could spend an hour with your mom, what is the one thing that you'd want to ask her? Oh, my gosh. What a question. What is the one thing I'd want to ask her? Oh, my word. I think I need to journal on this. This is such a good question. You know, I would want to know from my mum what makes her truly happy. Mm. What makes her truly happy? Like when, without all the stuff, you know, if it were just her and God, and God said to her, I'm going to give you whatever makes you happy, what would, what would you say? I'd love to know what that answer was. When you do that, you let me know how it comes out. I will. I we'll will. I'm very inspired by you. It's such a good <laughs> idea. All right, my darling. This has been a wonderful call. I, I, I really appreciate you. Thank you for listening to Stand Up and Speak Up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you are the victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, Florida, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can, make a small donation to help victims around the world receive the help they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfoteaming products at BenfoComplete.com. Use the special code STANDUP for a 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thank you for being with us today. Go to my website, The Woman Behind the Smile, for additional resources and information. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy the replays. My books are all available on Amazon.com and Audible, and I encourage you to join us again. Have a great day.